The Battered Locks and the Lake Washington Ship Canal officially opened July 4th, 1917, but their story starts a lot earlier. It really goes back to the very first days in Seattle's history, when people started dreaming about creating a waterway between our inland freshwater lakes and Puget Sound. There were two Seattle pioneers in particular who did more than just dream. And their names are Thomas Mercer and Harvey Pike. It is a fitting occasion to bestow new names on important features of this new territory. Our story begins in 1854, when Seattle was only two years old and really just a village in an area we now call Pioneer Square. We had a few houses and shops, sawmills and wharves, and were busy chopping down trees to help build another, much larger city down the coast called San Francisco. It was definitely a humble start, but the settlers had big ideas for the future. In the early summer of that year, they took the day off from sawing and hauling and walked about a mile through the woods to a lake known by the Indian name Tennis Chuck, meaning little water. It was July 4th and they wanted to celebrate Independence Day with a picnic, of course. There are no photographs of the picnic, but we can imagine what it was like from paintings of that era. The settlers had endured two long and rainy winters of hard work so we can easily picture them cutting loose with a lot of food, games, and maybe some dancing. The patriotic spirits were running especially high because this was the first Independence Day since Washington had won its own independence from Oregon and become its own territory of the United States. In this spirit, the man who was hosting the picnic, Thomas Mercer, got up to make a speech. My friends, as we gather on this Independence Day. We remember Mercer today from a street name and a photograph taken in his later years when he was a judge and sported a highly impressive beard. Mercer grew up in Ohio and Illinois and seems to have been a born leader. At the age of 14, he was managing his father's woolen mill. In 1852, he headed west on the Oregon Trail with his family. He was elected a wagon master for the 14 wagons for their five month, 2000 mile journey. After a brief stay in Salem, Oregon, he headed to Seattle where he homesteaded land north of the village. In addition to farming, he became the first local teamster hauling cargo to and from the wharves with the horses and wagon he had brought from Illinois. Mercer had only settled in the area about a year when he made his speech, but he already was a King County Commissioner. Now the village had no mayor, so a King County Commissioner was the highest local elected official. We know roughly what he said in his speech from a letter he wrote many years later. Beyond these hills to the east lies a lake called by the Indian name of Highest Chuck. Being the greatest lake in Washington territory, I propose that we christen it Lake Washington. Hear, hear! Oh, the main thing he did was to propose new names for Seattle's two major lakes. He suggested the largest one, which locals had called Highest Chuck or Big Water, be named in honor of Washington, George, and the new territory. For Tennis Chuck, the smaller lake where the picnic was happening, the name he proposed was Lake Union. Because of our determination that it will be the union of a system. He chose his name because, as he wrote in his letter, sometime it would be a connection between Lake Washington and the Bay. Now these words may be vague, but behind them lies a huge idea, an inland waterway allowing Seattle to move ships and cargo easily between the interior and the rest of the world. As I gaze on these waters, I foresee their shores crowded with ships' masts and smoking chimneys, harbingers of prosperity ahead for the great city of Seattle. Here, here! Three cheers! Hip, hip, huzzah! Mercer's constituents agreed. In his letter he wrote, the names were established after some little opposition. 63 years to the day later, July 4th, 1917, the vision articulated by Thomas Mercer, a waterway to the world, was opened to the world. In the years between, few people worked harder to make Mercer's dream a reality than an ambitious young man named Harvey Pike. Harvey was the son of John Pike, whose name is remembered today in a street, a public market, and a well-known blend of coffee. John Pike came west in 1852 in the wagon train led by Thomas Mercer. 
He was an architect and a carpenter and built much of early Seattle, including our first university building at what is now 4th Avenue and University Street. As a teenager, his son Harvey earned money by painting that building, as well as signboards for probably most of Seattle's early storefronts. In 1861, he cleared some land for the university, and instead of taking cash for his work, he took land, 161 acres on the Montlake Isthmus. He was only 19 years old, but he was wise enough to realize that this narrow strip of marshy bottomland had value. As long as anyone could remember, this is where the Native Americans and everyone else had to pick up their canoes and cargo and carry them between Hyas and Tennis Chucks, hence the name we call Eastern Lake Union Portage Bay. Soon after he acquired the land, Harvey Pike did something quite remarkable. He got a wheelbarrow, a pick, and a shovel and started to dig a canal all by himself. He didn't get very far, but he did succeed in digging his way into local folklore, where he is often portrayed as a cross between a visionary and a colorful crackpot. If we look a little closer, we may discover that Harvey Pike was no fool. This 1864 article in the Seattle Gazette sheds light on what he may have been planning. The Seattle Gazette describes discoveries of coal on the east side of Lake Washington, areas we now know as Coal Creek, Black Diamond, Newcastle. These were the best coal deposits on the west coast, but getting them to Seattle's coal bunkers required an arduous journey through the shallows of the Black and White Rivers to the Duwamish River and across Elliott Bay. The newspaper calls this route an insufficient outlet for the immense wealth of the country. It proposes a better and shorter route through Lakes Washington and Union. Of course, this would require digging a canal at Montlake, but the article suggests this might not be as difficult as it sounds. Lake Washington was several feet higher than Lake Union, the author writes, so a mere ditch through which to turn the water is all that is required and the canal will make itself. He was suggesting that once the fog gates were open, gravity and water pressure would do most of the work. Was this the vision of Harvey Pike when he started digging? It seems pretty likely, but there's no doubt he eventually realized that even creating a mere ditch between the lakes was a Herculean undertaking for just one man. In 1871, he took on partners and formed the Lake Washington Canal Company. But even with investors, digging a canal was more expensive than portaging across the isthmus. So they built a narrow gauge beast powered railway to haul coal carts between barges on the two lakes. In the 1880s, David Denny and Thomas Burke revived the canal idea, this time for floating logs to sawmills on Lake Union. They hired Chinese laborers to dig a modest canal where State Highway 520 is today. This log canal expanded over the years and eventually featured some rickety looking bridges and Seattle's first locks, which were all made of wood. By 1911, the log canal was big enough for these two teenagers to go through it in a canoe for an early version of a wild ways ride. Seattle continued to have bigger canal dreams, as you can see in this imaginary bird's eye view from 1912. After decades of lobbying, we finally got hold of federal money and the Army Corps of Engineers came to town to oversee construction of the locks and the ship canal. On July 4th, 1917, exactly 63 years after Thomas Mercer made his Independence Day speech, a grand parade of ships made its way through the ship canal and onwards into Lake Washington. Mercer and Pike were 20 years gone, but the canal they imagined was now a reality. Every year in May, Seattle celebrates opening day of the boating season with a nautical parade that goes through the Montlake Cut. You can imagine Thomas Mercer and Harvey Pike, the men who first articulated the vision and the men who first implemented the vision, cheering with the rest of the crowd under the Montlake Bridge, watching boats glide through the waterway they believed in so many years ago. 